I wish I was gonna start this off with like lots of humor other than that weird joke I just made. Uh, <laughs> but I have bad news. <laughs> Education's in a lot of trouble. And I've been trying to think about it and think about it and think about it. And the more I read about it and the more I've watched and the more, like last night, you know, you think, what's he doing? He's probably out partying the night before his workshop because last chance. But no, in fact, I went down another social emotional learning rabbit hole um, and found more and more documents and you start realizing just how pervasive this problem is. Education is in big trouble to the point where now I am extraordinarily worried about the entire educational system. And this isn't one of these kind of rah-rah, government schools are the problem kind of talks. Education as a system overall is in big trouble. And I wanna lay most of the blame for that trouble on a dead Brazilian guy by the name of Paulo Freire that we will talk about quite a lot since I said it, I think correctly, with the Portuguese. I'll spell it for you because he's gonna come up a whole bunch of times. It is F-R-E-I-R-E. Paulo is spelled P-A-U-L-O, um, Paulo Freire. What's happened is our schools have adopted Paulo Freire's methods, and in other words, your kids go to Paulo Freire's schools, and virtually everything follows from there. Paulo Freire is a character we're gonna talk a lot, a lot about more this afternoon or this evening. Um, I'm gonna tell you how we got to Paulo Freire being significant in this lecture, but I want to give you a picture of what I mean about education being big trouble. If you think about everybody's favorite democratic twerker, um, Tara Mack, who recently was very famous for replacing the Washington Monument with her upside down twerking antics on the beach. Uh, that's a meme, that's a joke, haha. <laughs> um, Tara Mack, when this horrific shooting in Uvalde came, it happened and unfolded and whatever horrific stories go with that is another matter, she immediately took to Twitter activism as one does and she immediately uh, promoted, if not helped facilitate, I don't have that level of accusation, um, she immediately promoted a political stunt involving hundreds of students. Those hundreds of students were from Providence, Rhode Island schools. They went to the state capitol on school time. They laid on the stairs of the state house outside and did a die-in. Now, um, great. You got these politically active students that are ready to, at a moment's notice, go on behalf of some left-wing political activism laying on state house steps during school hours, excused from school to do this, probably coordinated by adults to do this. And yet, behind the scenes, which you can't see in the photo op or the agitating, misspelled um, tweet that this alleged queer educator, that's how she describes herself on Twitter as a queer educator, uh, put out, you don't see behind the scenes that only 6% of the students in Providence, Rhode Island can do mathematics at grade level. Six. And only 14% of them can read at grade level. So what you have is a situation where education is in such a severe crisis that not just some, but a wide majority, a in some cases ultra majority, of the students are failing at academic attainment but are ready at a moment's notice to be engaged in half-witted political activism and media stunts on behalf of political activists posing as politicians, teachers, or what have you. And this is the, leg the legacy of Paulo Freire. It's a straight line from Paulo Freire's writings about education in the 1970s and 1980s, a straight line from there to those kids laying on the, on the steps in Providence, Rhode Island, unable to read, unable to do math, totally ready and able to show up to a political protest in a moment's notice. And the reason is because Paulo Freire gave us the method, or gave them the method, I should say, to steal education. Your children's education, and that's the ma major theme of this, if you leave with nothing else, you need to go home realizing your children's education has been stolen from them by Marxists. Marxists are famous for always having wanted to steal the means of production. They usually say seize the means of production, but that's stealing them. They want to seize the means of production. Well, they want to seize the means of production of your children, and they did that by stealing their education. On the outside, the education looks kind of like education still. On the inside, it's producing 6% of students who can do math and 100% of students who can show up to a political protest. Education has been vastly repurposed to do something that it wasn't meant to do because it has been stolen. 
So over the course of these four lectures, to give you kind of an overview roadmap, we're gonna to start today by talking about the critical turn in education in this lecture. That is the actual theft of education. The critical turn is the formal name for the theft of education. Later this evening, we're gonna talk about the Marxification of education. That's where we're gonna talk a lot about Paulo Freire uh, and what Paulo Freire brought to education, what he did to education. And believe it or not, what that gives you is the means and the mechanism by which education was stolen. And he actually Marxified education so that it looks like education from the outside, but it is Marxist on the inside. So he changed it entirely. But I'm actually gonna present that a little bit differently because I want people to realize that there is a significant establishment clause challenge waiting behind Paulo Freire's work. They have turned school into Marxist religious school. And the First Amendment can and should bear on that. And believe it or not, it would clean up a lot of the problem very quickly if that were to be properly recognized. So I'm actually going to make out the case that Paulo Freire is not so responsible for critical pedagogy, which is what we're here to discuss, although it's based off of his work, he's actually responsible for a Marxist religious revival. The theology of Marxism had hit a wall and he was the large revi revivalist of the 1970s and 1980s that brought it back, just like there's been religious revivals in other faiths in other parts of the world at other times. In the third lecture tomorrow, we're gonna to start off by talking about the process that Paulo Freire replaced education with, and which is conscientization or a political education. So your kid's education in academic attainment has been stolen from them and has been replaced by political education. And immediately we see this stunt in Providence making sense. They're not being educated, they're being educated to be political activists or trained to be political activists or, dare I say it, groomed to be political activists. And in the fourth of the lectures tomorrow afternoon, we're gonna talk about social emotional learning, which is um, the specific tool that this is uh, being accomplished through. And in fact, we're going to be able to link this to the broad purpose. Believe it or not, this is a large global push to completely change the world. The goal is to seize the means of production while stealing the method of education. And in fact, the big picture goal of what's happening in the world is that the Marxists figured out in all their previous attempts that it failed, with that what they think the reason is that it failed is that they either figured out how to get the means of production without getting the people, or they figured out how to get the people without getting the means of production. And so they've orchestrated an attempt now to get both simultaneously. They have started to change the economic system from the top down, and they are trying to change the people who are going to live in that economic system and then implement them both at the same time. The portrait of a graduate is the portrait of their future. Those are the future workers of the uh, new world order that they're trying to establish. And I use that um, phrase, that loaded phrase with all that it represents. So we're gonna move down or move into the critical turn in education specifically now. The critical turn in education took place starting in the 60s and really ramped up in the 80s and early 90s. Um, I gave a little blurb, I'll actually read my own writing for a second about what the theft of education in the critical turn looks like. It is that education has been stolen right out from under us and our children. The name of the theft of this education is the critical turn in education. There's a book by that title if you want to read it for yourself. It is titled The Critical Turn in Education. It's by a man named Isaac Gotsman. Uh, he's a professor at Iowa State University. The critical turn in education led education as a system to abandon teaching to adopt critical pedagogy, which is a form of activist training. The purpose of critical pedagogy, which is the new model of education that has been kind of standard since the 90s, early 90s, really, or mid 90s, 95 being kind of a landmark year in that regard, is to solve what's called the problem of reproduction. This is what the Marxists were butting their heads against. This is why the Marxist faith was dwindling and failing by the 1970s. It is a problem of reproduction. Society tends to reproduce itself. How do you defeat that? And what they realize is that you have to install a completely new system from all the angles at once, top down, bottom up, and inside out. You have to change the cultural glue. You have to change the top down management. You have to change the bottom up demand. You have to get supply, demand, and how people think about themselves all at the same time. That's why they stole education. Education has been stolen from us on the inside while retaining the outside form, and that's why we see what happened in Providence, Rhode Island, for example. We see this abysmal learning loss problem. Not learning loss because of masks, not learning loss because of schools being closed for the COVID, not learning loss because of any other thing, but because education isn't doing education anymore. 
it's teaching political activism, it's teaching Marxist, I would say thought reform, but it's not reform, it's just form, because the children are just being formed into the Marxist mold in their schools. In other words, education has been stolen and repurposed to Marxist ends. And if you don't understand this, you can't understand what's happening in education. You can't understand what's happening in our country. And you can't take appropriate action to stop what's happening before it gets to the point where they snap the trap with those two pieces and we're stuck in a new world filled with just enough people to make it kind of limp along until lots of people die, as happens in every Marxist revolution in the end. So I wanna actually open up with the discussion of what the critical turn in education is just by reading to you a couple of paragraphs from Isaac Gotsman's book on the subject. The full title of this book is The Critical Turn in Education from Marxist Critique to Post-Structuralist Feminism to Critical Theories of Race. So if they tell you that critical race theory is not part of what's happening in your schools, obviously we all know they're lying. We're two years into knowing they're lying. It's literally the third part of the process, according to the subtitle of the book of history of how education was transformed in the critical turn, critical theories of race. Post-structural feminism is the birthplace of queer theory. Post-structural feminism, therefore, is why comprehensive sex education has the gender ideology and the queer Marxist theory at its heart. None of this is surprising if you actually trace the history and you see what's going on and what their agendas with, with it are. So I'm going to read to you from page one of this book and tell you, he tells you immediately what happened. Where did the critical turn in education happen? To the question, he says, where did all the 60s radicals go? The most accurate answer noted Paul Boole, 1991, in his classic Marxism in the United States, would be neither to the religious cults nor yuppiedom, but to the classroom. Where did all the 60s radicals go? To the classroom. After the fall of the proper noun, capitalized new left, arose a common noun, lowercase, new left. So after the fall of the new left, arose a new left. I don't know if I can intonate that to give you the idea. The first one is a proper noun, and the second one is not a proper noun. It's cute in print, not so good out loud. And he labels it the academic left. So after the fall of the new left arose an academic left. For many of these young scholars, Marxist thought, and particularly what some refer to as Western Marxism or neo-Marxism, and what I will refer to as the critical Marxist tradition, was an intellectual anchor. Doesn't mince words, doesn't kid around. Page one, the Marxists took over education. The radicals of the 1960s, losing in the streets, went to the classroom, and that's how it happened. Doesn't mince words. As participants in the radical politics of the 60s entered graduate school and moved into faculty positions and started publishing, the critical turn began to change scholarship throughout the humanities and social sciences. The field of education was no exception. The turn to critical Marxist thought is a defining moment in the past 40 years of educational scholarship. The turn to critical Marxist thought is a defining moment in the past 40 years of educational scholarship. How did this happen? Especially for educational scholars who identify as part of the political left. It introduced the ideas and vocabulary that continue to frame most conversations in the field about social justice, such as hegemony, ideology, these are Marxist words, consciousness, praxis, and most importantly, the word critical itself, which has become ubiquitous as a descriptor for leftist educational scholarship. Initially sequestered in curriculum studies in the sociology of education, today critical scholarship is frequently published in the journals of some of the field's most historically conservative areas, such as educational administration and science education. The critical turn radicalized the field. This book was published in 2016, so it's now six years old. Some of the most conservative corners left in academics of education had already been fully leftist radicalized at least six years ago. So everybody who wants to ask you the question, maybe you are that person asking the question of the world, how did it get like this? How did this happen? There's your answer. 
40 years of neo-Marxists controlling education while Republicans focused on bullcrap like the economy. Look how well they did with that. How much was your uh, drive up here with the gas? Like $10 million? So why was there a critical turn at all? Why did there have to be a critical turn in education? It's like I said, they had to solve the problem of reproduction. Ever since the 1920s, Marxists have realized that somehow Western civilizations are strong. Somehow Western civilizations reproduce themselves from one generation to the next. Parents raise their children. They often raise them in churches. They send them to schools. And in particular, since we're talking about education, those schools reproduce the society at hand. They teach them things that will be useful to go out into the world and the society we live in. You want to get a good job, right? Paulo Freire actually criticizes that as a motivation for education. That's how you reproduce the existing society. It's by teaching people to get a good job, because it's a good job in the existing society, not the transformed world. You teach them the values of how to be well-behaved. You teach them the civics of your country. This reproduces the existing society. That problem they figured out throughout the stretch of the 20th century prevents Western countries from going Marxist. Western civilization reproduces itself very effectively, and that's obviously because the people that live in this civilization tend to like it. It tends to work. It doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work perfectly but it tends to work and most people feel like it gives them a pretty good shake. So the society tends to reproduce itself. So that's what has to be overcome. The way you overcome the problem of reproduction is stealing education so that you change it so that it doesn't reproduce the existing society. But the trouble is you have to do that within the existing society. In other words, what you have to do is you have to figure out how to get inside the existing thing what we have, you have to work with what there is, but you have to transform it on the inside without it transforming enough on the outside for anybody to notice. You can't just set up a gulag and send the kids there. Nobody would, would allow this. You, you actually have to use the existing system and transform it from the inside. This is an idea that came, got translated into English in 1970 by uh, one Pete Buttigieg's father, Joseph Buttigieg, uh, that is the same mayor, Secretary of Transportation, Pete. Uh, his father translated Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks into English at Notre Dame in 1970. He was one of the lead translators on the team. Antonio Gramsci is one of the two primary cultural Marxist fathers, and in particular, what he focused on is this idea of cultural hegemony, that Western societies reproduce themselves by producing cultural values that they transmit from one generation to the next, that they use to safeguard their society, and that they are primarily put out through cultural institutions. He named five in particular, uh, family, religion, education, media, and law. And education, he said, was particularly important because Many of the other aspects, not necessarily family, but many of the other aspects, whether it's religion, whether it's media, whether it's law, these kinds of things you go get educated to become. And so if you get a hold of education, you get a hold of some of these other transmitters of cultural values. So the goal is to, that he, he said, is that you have to somehow infiltrate. The, the long march of the institutions was named by Rudy Deutschke in uh, reference to Mao Zedong and to what Antonio Gramsci what was do, what, what, I should say what Gramsci wrote about and what Mao Zedong was doing in his Cultural Revolution. And the idea is to get inside of an institution, say education, transform it from within so that you create a counter hegemony, what we would call this in kind of modern war parlance is you'd create a color revolution inside of an institution to change it fundamentally from within. And when you gain enough institutional power, when you gain enough policy power, when you gain enough numbers or some combination thereof, you flip the organization to do something completely different, but you want to maintain the disguise as long as you can. Therefore, what you can do is you can create a new system that's kind of walled off in the same way that cancer walls itself off from the immune system and it can't be detected. You create a new system in a bubble inside of the existing system that you then eventually use that uh, transformed cancerous Trans, uh, counter hegemonic uh, system to erupt out and metastasize and transform everything else. That's the agenda, that's the goal, that's what Marxists in the 20s were thinking about and by the 70s were implementing. That's the challenge. 
to overcome the problem of reproduction. So we'll turn to Paulo Freire to understand what the problem of reproduction is. He wrote a book in 1985 that is, I think, the most influential book on education. Uh, he's much more famous for his 1970 book titled Pedagogy of the Oppressed, but he wrote a book in 1985 called The Politics of Education that I've had the pleasure of reading about 11 times now um, in painful detail. And I think it lays it, I think it's, frankly, it's the same book but less weird. Um, Paulo didn't actually have that many ideas. That's a terribly controversial thing to say if they heard me, because he's like their idol. But he didn't have that many ideas, and he just kind of rewrote them again and again and again, which is kind of a hallmark of a cult leader. Um, few ideas, repeat them in a newer and newer language that everybody's awed by and gets sucked in by. But in the politics of education in 1985, this is the book that got him imported into the American education system. He was ignored mostly, even after Pedagogy of the Oppressed in North America, uh, until this book came out and through the uh, action of the guy who wrote the foreword, Henry Giroux, uh, making sure people paid attention to it, it finally got picked up and then they went backwards and picked up his 1970 book, which is now the third most cited piece of literature in the humanities and social sciences. So in the politics of education, he wrote, education for liberation, liberation by the way means liberation from the existing society, it means communism. Education for liberation does not merely free students from blackboards just to offer them projectors. See, it's not just modernizing your classroom. We're not going away from the blackboard and just having a projector, we're going to do something much more profound. On the contrary, it is concerned as a social praxis, in other words, as a means of transforming society toward Marxism, with helping to free human beings from the oppression that strangles them in their objective reality. It is therefore political education. Just as political as the education that claims to be neutral, although actually serving the power elite. And so there's the Marxist trick. See, education's always political. What you're already doing is political. You're just political on behalf of the power elite. We are offering a political program that is not on behalf of the power elite, and so therefore everything's on the same ground. It's morally level. It's all political, except you are doing the morally bad kind, and we are doing the morally good kind by resisting the power elite. So we have the right to take over. And what you're doing is just the same thing as what you accuse us of doing. Constant iron law of woke projection, constant confession by projection, constant accuse your opponent of what you're actually doing to distract from the fact that you're doing it and to lay the blame on them. He says, it is thus a form of education that can only, this is education for liberation, it is thus a form of education that can only be put into practice systematically when society is radically transformed. So you can't even have true Marxist education until after we've transformed society. So this is an expression of the problem of reproduction because we don't have that yet. Only the innocent, he said, could possibly think that the power elite would encourage a type of education that denounces them even more clearly than do all the contradictions of their power structures. You see the Marxism is quite evident there. The contradictions of the power structures. That's what, the, the, but we can de denounce them even more directly. They denounce themselves with their dialectical contradictions, but we can denounce them directly. Such naivety, he says, also reveals a dangerous underestimation of the capacity and audacity of the elite. Truly liberating education can only be put into practice outside the ordinary system. He repeats himself. And even then with great cautiousness by those who overcome their naivety and commit themselves to authentic liberation. In other words, by cultists. Only cultists can do it, and even they're likely to screw it up. Anybody who's not fully on board with the cult has no chance. And you have to overcome this problem that the existing system, the, the power elite, are not going to let you do a form of education that will dethrone them. So you have to figure out a new form of education that gets around them, but you have to, in some sense, trick them in order to be able to do it. Otherwise, they'll call you on it because they won't allow it. So what you have to do is steal education. And this is what inspired the critical turn in education. Paulo Freire was a critical theorist. The Marxists criticize him not as, for not being Marxist enough. He was a neo-Marxist, a critical Marxist, as Isaac Gotsman calls them. He had adopted critical theory, not classical Marxist theory. He was looking at cultural issues. He was looking at the uh, very terms of the existing society, and not economic conditions alone. And so what do you need then if you're going to fundamentally transform the system? Paulo Freire tells us we go back to 1970 and pedagogy of the oppressed. You need radicals. You need radicals taking over education. He says the more radical a person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. 
so that knowing it better, he or she can better transform it. Remember, the point is not to understand the world, but to change it. That's one of Karl Marx's most famous remarks. That's also paraphrased in the first two paragraphs of Critical Race Theory and Introduction, if you wonder. This is all the same stuff. It's the same thing. It's actually a little boring to sit up and talk about the same thing again and again and again in different domains. This individual is not afraid, the radical, is not afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. In other words, through the Marxist lens. This person is not afraid to meet the people or to enter into dialogue with them. This person does not consider himself or herself the proprietor of history or of all people or the liberator of the oppressed, but he or she does commit himself or herself within history to fight at their side. And so what you need is committed radicals who have adopted this theory of transformation, in other words, the Marxist religion, and they are the only people who can possibly create a new educational system that operates within but outside of the existing system until the society can be radically transformed and then the real deal can finally arrive. Real Marxist education hasn't been tried yet. We have to have real Marxism before it can be tried. Friday's ideas are the basis for critical pedagogy, but not just by straight importation of Paulo Freire. He had to come through some other people who kind of brought him into the North American context. And in particular, we'll talk about Henry Giroux. But in the next lecture, what we're going to understand, we're going to spend the next lecture is entirely about Paulo Freire um, and kind of the third one as well. Uh, where he, what we see is that he's quite literally stealing education. I want to kiss keep hammering that point so that uh, the existing society and its uh, stakeholders, if you will, uh, can manifest the radically transformed society as a religious revival of the Marxist faith. And so stakeholders is a key word, by the way. The stakeholders, of course, even though your children are in the schools, you are not a true stakeholder, except when they write some nice thing about a paragraph saying, we listened to some stakeholders, which means they got a very biased sample of people whose kids are in schools and said, we're going to listen to those people. The stakeholder said, we need more radicalism. We need a drag queen to come in and tell all the stories. Aren't you glad I didn't wear my makeup today? I'm just kidding. I don't have any. I did have to wear makeup for like a video the other day, and I was looking so good. Um, I put an anti-shine on me. It was great. So um, you have to bring these radicals in in order to transform education fundamentally. Uh, and what you're actually doing is you are going to use expert stakeholders to determine what that looks like and hear their voices. Um, we're going to exit a shareholder model of capitalism to a stakeholder model of capitalism. That's the top-down transformation where they uh, seize the means of production. And meanwhile, we're going to use these so-called stakeholders to redefine what a proper education looks like, probably in social and emotional terms so that it can sit outside, radically outside, the existing system. You know, like the existing system where you don't bring drag queens to school? You just don't do that? Like nobody in their right mind would think that's a good idea in the existing system? Well, the stakeholder said it's necessary for LGBTQ youth to have drag queens at the schools. So the milieu that we're stepping into in 1970 or so when all the 60s radicals left the streets and went into the classrooms is desperation, despair, and if we're going to talk just about education, it's about the society at large for the critical Marxists at the time, but if we're going to talk just about education, that the educators or the system of education is in fact trapped in a reproduction. In fact, the, 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 the Marxist critique that Isaac Gotsman's referring to in the subtitle of The Critical Turn in Education comes from a place of absolute despair. They have no idea. They've actually kind of concluded that no matter what you do, no matter how much John Dewey you use, no matter how many different you know, reform methods you apply, there's no way to get around the fact that schools reproduce the existing society because they were a product of the existing society. So the, this is what Marx called the inversion of praxis. The existing society creates the school. The school is made in the image of the existing society, so therefore when it whether it's the teachers, whether it's the administration, whether it's the structure, whether it's the classroom, it reproduces all of the modes and underlying uh, operations of the existing society, and then the students learn the existing society. And so there's no way to get around this. That's the attitude, the milieu. There's no way to get around this problem of reproduction. And it was a bad time to be a Marxist. 1968, in many senses, uh, not all senses, failed. In some senses, it succeeded. But this is the depression that they're having. There's no way to get around this problem of reproduction. Every society will reproduce itself. The schools will always be built out of society to reproduce society in an endless circle. And this 
Uh, two Marxist educators that are highly credited with laying the groundwork for the critical turn are Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis. They were actually not educators, I should say, they were economists. Um, and they wrote a book called Schooling in Capitalist America in 1976. You can tell if, by the title that this is a very Marxist book. Schooling in Capitalist America, and they said the educational system basically neither adds nor neither adds to nor subtracts from the degree of inequality and repression originating in the economic sphere. Rather, it reproduces and legitimates a pre-existing pattern in the process of training and stratifying the workforce. So being Marxist, they're looking at the modes of economic production. They're looking at the fact that education is to prepare people to have good jobs, in other words, to enter the economic workforce. And as Marxists, they see that as fundamentally stratified between the bosses and the workers. And you have to train lots of workers and a few managers, and the education system is actually set up to basically do that and to filter who's gonna be which one. And it doesn't add to nor subtract from the degree of inequality or repression that arises in the economic system. It just merely reproduces it. How does this occur? Though they use Marxist critique to try to explain how it occurs. How does this occur? The heart of the process is to be found not in the content of the educational encounter, or the process of the information transfer. Not in the content or the process. Not in the curriculum. Not what they're teaching. Not in the method of teaching, the pedagogy, the educational theory. The heart of the process is to be found not in the content of the educational encounter or the process of information transfer, but in the form. The social relations of the educational encounter. Now imagine if you could retool schools to be based entirely on social and emotional learning to completely transform the social relations of the school at its heart. The form of the school, a third dimension that people aren't looking at around the corner. It's not what you're teaching. It's not how you're teaching it. It's the entire structure of the process, the idea of school itself that reproduces the existing society. These correspond closely, they said, to the social relations of dominance, subordination, and motivation in the economic sphere. Through the educational encounter, individuals are induced to accept the degree of powerlessness with which they will be faced as mature workers. So the point of school is to indoctrinate people into accepting their fate as an exploited worker alienated from his work product. Critical pedagogy comes on the scene. The critical turn in education exists to solve this riddle of the problem of reproduction. And it's going to do so in and through education. It realizes that Antonio Gramsci had a point that if you get a hold of education, you get a hold of the other cultural institutions. Who will be your media people? People who went to school for media. Who will be your journalists? People who went to school for journalism. Who will be your doctors, people who went to medical school, who will be your lawyers, people who went to law school, who will be your professionals, people who majored in political science or something. On and on it goes. Who will be your teachers, people who majored in education. Aha. If you can get the colleges of education, you can get everything. And this is the strategy that they started to work out. Now I want to make a point. We're talking about the problem of reproduction and how it's a huge problem to these critical Marxists. They can't figure out how to beat the problem of reproduction. Huge problem. It's not a problem to normal people. So if you're confused about the so-called problem of reproduction, this is a Marxist term. It's a Marxist idea. It's a, from the Marxist perspective. Normal people do want their society on the broad picture or the big picture to reproduce itself. That's the point of having a civilization is that it continues. They want the society in its basic form to reproduce itself one generation after the other. That's why you raise your children and the values that the society holds. That's why you raise your children or send your children to schools to get good jobs and to build the society that we're going to live in. That's when you say, I'm thinking about the future for my children. That's the thing that you're thinking of. We want successful civilizations like our own to reproduce themselves generation after generation. We want our children to grow up in a similar but improved world compared to the one that we're in, to the degree that that's possible. It's only a problem to Marxists. And not only do Marxists think it's a problem because they think that the existing system, and I would, you would, I would say oh, classical liberalism or whatever regime we're in now, no, whatever the existing system is, is the problem. That there is an existing system is the problem. For Karl Marx, the full transcendence of the idea of private property and labor itself is the goal. In other words, the systemless system, which sounds a little bit like utopia, 
magical thinking, not real, not possible. That's the only thing. The system that's not a system, the state withers away. It's a stateless, classless society where everything just works. That's the only, it's not, the system that's not a system is the only thing they want. So any existing system, but in particular our existing system, should not be allowed to continue, should not be allowed to be reproduced. And so what they realize is that learners need to overcome this. And who is best as a learner to want to reject the existing society? Well, young, impressionable people, where you don't have to do thought reform. You can just do thought formation. You can just form their thoughts. You can take the child for a handful of years and plant a seed so deep that you'll never uproot what grows, as Lenin said. So let's take a sidestep then into Marxism, critical Marxism, cultural Marxism, and kind of see how these lead, kind of with, with, with the lens of getting to critical pedagogy in terms of how it's gonna solve the problem of reproduction. We go all the way back to Karl Marx, what is Marxism itself? Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next lecture too. Marxism is not an economic theory. Get it out of your head. It is not a social theory. Get that out of your head. It is a theory of man and the world. It is a fundamental basic philosophy about what the world is, how the world works, and what man's role in it is. That means it's a religion. If you want to split hairs and say it's not a religion because what's the deity and all that, I've got a whole workshop series I did on the theology of Marxism. You're welcome to see it. It's man himself, by the way, perfected at the end of history. That's beside the point. You can call it a metaphilosophical system. You can call it a broad philosophy. You can call it a theology. I say it's a theology. It is a unambiguously a theory of man in the world. It is a basic explanation for what the world is and what man's role in, in that world is. And by the way, that is the definition that the Supreme Court of the United States cares about in determining whether or not it violates the Establishment Clause, not whether or not it has a God. That is not what qualifies something as a religion. Is it, one, a system of belief and practice that has a fundamental theory of the world and man's role in it, such that it gives rise to duties of conscience. That's the definition, Ben Clement's definition of religion for the Supreme Court in First Amendment jurisprudence. It is unambiguous. This isn't even a debate. It's not even a question that Marxism satisfies that definition, has always satisfied that definition, and that the woke version that we're dealing with now in a particular critical pedagogy in our uh, state-run schools is in violation of that. Absolute violation. You want a woke private school? Fine, that's your business, just like any other religious school. Good luck to your bottom line. <laughs> woke government school? State religion. First Amendment law needs to bear on this. It needs to bear on this yesterday. It's not even a question. So what is Marx's theory of man and theory of the world. It's easier if we do the theory of the world first, so we'll do them backwards. The world is dialectic. It's in a process of transformation, but the transformation happens in a particular way. The way that the process of transformation happens is that we greet the world as we see it, and we confront it with the ideas we have about the world, and those are in opposition. We have a theory about the world and how it should be, perfect communism or socialism or whatever it is, and what we see in the world doesn't work. There's contradictions. The weight of the contradictions discredit themselves, Freire said. We're going to sh discredit them even more directly. That's what he's talking about. So there's the idea we have about the world and there's what's actually happening in the world. Those are in contradiction with one another and those contradictions have to be resolved. What this actually is in practice is that we envision a perfect social world, a perfectly socialist world or communist world with a perfectly socialist man and we see that man is fallen, but he's not fallen because he's a sinner, as it says in Genesis, because he's paying the wages of sin. Instead, it is because the fall of man was a division of labor, where one man decided to estrange another man from his intrinsic nature as somebody who can create the world, transforms the world according to his needs, to his visions, to his imagination, to his wants. So the world is unfolding according to a dialectical process where opposites are reconciled in terms of what we think things should be versus what they actually are. That's the nature of the contradictions. We have a very rich capitalist nation. It produces all this stuff, but look, there's poor people. Contradiction. We are not distributing the fruits of capitalism fairly. Contradiction. 
We have a post-racial society in the civil, post-civil rights era, but there's still racism, contradiction. Education should liberate man from his limitations, but it reproduces the society, contradiction. In other words, what the Marxist theory of the world is when we get to the human level is that it's stratified. There are certain people who are haves, there are certain people who are have-nots. They're in conflict with one another because the people who have advantage or privilege in that society have arranged the system to their own benefit, knowingly or unknowingly, to the exclusion of those other people because their benefit depends on other people being excluded. You need a serf class to work for you to give you the things so that you can be the privileged class that puts them intrinsically in conflict. Marx believes that you can awaken to this. You can awaken to this fact of reality. And this is where we get to the theory of man. Man is a conscious subject. Man is a person who's not just conscious, what's different from him being an animal. He's not just conscious. He's conscious that he's conscious. He knows that he knows. Or he knows that he doesn't know. And thus, he can be made conscious of the intrinsic, unjust, stratified, conflict-oriented position that is the real material reality, the objective conditions in which he lives. He called this a science, so he said that this is objective. He said this is the scientific study of history, the scientific study of society and man. But ultimately what you are is you are a creator. You are a transformational subject. What separates you as a human being from an animal is that, well, an animal might go, a bee, for example, he uses the example of a bee, might go build a tremendously interesting nest, complex, hexagons everywhere, great geometry, look at how good it is, murder hornets probably build really big ones. They don't have a vision of the nest in their head and then build it. You picture in your mind something creative, in your imagination. Then you go make it. If you have a vision for a picnic table and you have a tree and a saw and maybe a hammer and some nails, you can just go do that. You can turn the tree into something that it's not, and in fact, something that's fit for human use. That means you've humanized the tree. And in recognizing that you have this capacity, you've humanized yourself. Marx's theory about the division of labor is that if you are in the haves, if you're the employer, if I employ you to make the picking table for me, maybe you did, maybe you did a great job. But it wasn't your vision. I stole from you the ability for you to bring your vision into the world by paying you something abstract like money to bring my vision into the world instead. I brought my vision into the world on your back. And it's even worse if I pay you to cut down the tree and I pay you to cut it into boards and I pay you to assemble the picnic table. Each one of you has now been more estranged from the product. Why is the communist flag a hammer and a sickle? Because the laborer who wields a hammer and the peasant who wields a sickle are the only authentic workers. Everybody else is estranged from the products of their efforts. They, in fact, are estranged by the division of labor process, and the end of the division of labor is the actual dawning of man as he should be. So you actually, in this worldview, have a duty of conscience. It's a view of how the world works. Dialectical materialism is said to be even how like the planets move and everything else, if you read Engel's writings on the issue. It's a theory of the world. It's a theory of man's role in the world. Your goal is to realize yourself to be a transformational subject and then to transform the world and then to deal with the fact that if you want to transform the world one way and you want to transform the world a different way and you guys are in conflict with one another about what the world should look like or one of you employs the other to try to bring your vision in and you have a competitive system, you're estranging one another, you're estranging yourselves, etc. and that all has to be undone. So the duty of conscience is to realize that we are all in this together as it has been said, and to come together as a truly social being, man and his species being, Marx said, is tr perfectly social, and to re remember and realize that we're a tr perfectly social being who pays each other's bills and uses somebody else's money to pay for everything and make sure everything works out great because Marx didn't want to pay his bills. It's not more complicated than that. The way this whole thing works though, and this is important for education, is through the role of ideology. Ideology is a specific word we use all the time. We all talk about it, ideological this, ideologically that, he's an ideologue, ah. Ideology had a very specific meaning for Marx. What ideology meant when Marx used it is the set of myths that the ruling class and society tell themselves about why society should be this way. And they feed these myths, largely through education in these more advanced societies, to the underclass to keep them satisfied. For Marx, for example, religion was one such myth. It's the opium of the people. That's why he said that. 
It keeps you numb to your suffering. So the upper class, the priests, teach you religion so that you won't rise up against a world filled with suffering. You can rationalize your suffering, you can give it up to God, and then you're not taking it to the priest who's actually keeping you down by teaching you how to deal with it. You won't rise up. You've been anesthetized to your suffering. So ideology is the operation that brainwashes everybody into accepting society. So the goal of Marxism is to overcome ideology. He said that his theory is the end of ideology. He said, no Marxist ideology. That's actually an oxymoron by technical definition. Marxist ideology cannot exist. It does exist. It is, in fact, an ideology. But according to the way Marx defined ideology, his view is the only one that's not an ideology. Everything else is an ideology. It's awfully handy. So what you have to do is you have to figure out a way to circumvent the ideological training. And critical pedagogy becomes the tool to do that. And the only way that you can actually transform the world is to have that awakened consciousness that you are a transforming conscious subject. It can only be put into practice by people who have been conscientized, as Paulo Freire refers to them, which means brainwashed into the Marxist not ideology. And so critical pedagogy, the critical theory of education, exists specifically so that it can raise up through what looks like education, through a false process of education, conscious subjects made to believe that it is their lot in the world to transform the world according to the dialectical process that the world is characterized by according to Marx and his predecessor Hegel. So this is Marxism, but Marxism didn't work. And by 1920, it was apparent, even with the success of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, that Marxism didn't work. There were two huge flaws by 1920 that led to the birth of cultural Marxism. One of those is that it worked in Russia. It wasn't supposed to work in Russia. Marx said there's a process, it's a scientific unfolding of history. You're supposed to go from slave economies into aristocratic estate economies, feudal economies, and then from those you're supposed to go into capitalist economies, and then the contradictions build up so much that you finally have the workers' revolt, they seize the means of production of society and man, and you produce a socialist society that will eventually evolve into the perfected communist society that's socialism with no management, no, no, no state, no class, no state, the perfect transcendence. You practice it long enough, you have it forced on you long enough, and eventually you'll just do it. That's literally communist theory. Well, Russia wasn't capitalist. Russia was a peasant agrarian society, and it had a revolution, and the revolutions in Europe failed. That was a big question mark for the Western Marxists. They didn't know why that was. Second thing that happened was World War I broke out. The Marxists were very confident going into World War I that the workers, one country to the other, would cobble together, form a giant workers' movement that spanned international borders, and that the revolution was at hand. <laughs> False. In every single country, the workers cobbled into their national identities. Why are they so obsessed and hate hateful of nationalism? Because nationalism was the thing that thwarted them in World War I in the 1910s. Nationalism was the thing that people cared about more in Western societies than about worker solidarity across international boundaries. Big problem. So they had to solve these problems and they had to retool Marxism to solve and explain these problems. And what they did, as I already mentioned, with Antonio Gramsci being the, the key figure in this regard, uh, they figured out that the world oper operates through cultural hegemony. It's a cultural force, a cultural power. The culture likes itself and reproduces itself, and it's not quite clear how this works, but Gramsci said it happens through the institutions of culture, and so that we have to infiltrate those and create counter-hegemonies within them. But they also laid out the general plan in the German as Aufheben der Kultur, which means to abolish the culture. You have to abolish the existing culture, but in fact, Aufheben's a funny German word that has three meanings at once. It means to abolish, to keep, and to lift up. The Marxists translate it as sublate, not abolish. They have a different word when they use the word abolish. And it is actually to keep the essence of the thing, that's the keep, while abolishing the particulars and then to lift it up to a higher level of understanding. In other words, a synthetic level of understanding if you follow the dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis is the combination of opposites. So you're going to lift it up to a synthetic understanding on a higher level. So in some sense, the goal of Marxism is to create a synthetic world for synthetic men who have been created to live in it to uh, exist. 
that's the goal of Marxism. But they, what they realize is, well, what we have in the West is cultural hegemony has come into being. The cultural institutions in advanced democracies and advanced capitalist countries are the problem. They produce culture. And so what we have to do is establish counter hegemonies within them to dissolve, to destroy, to Althaben the culture. Now, this took place in various places in different ways, but in particular, another guy, George Lukács, a Hungarian Marxist, he wrote in 1923 a book called History and Class Consciousness, focused on the nature of class consciousness, a concept by Marx that the working class could be awakened to the fact that it's in a class and that class is exploitative or exploited and alienated and can be awakened to be revolutionary. And he said, no, no, it's more complicated than that. It looks like it unfolds in a graduated sequence. There are stages to understanding your situation in a class. So we have to conscientize the working class. Gramsci was writing similar stuff. Gramsci was saying, well, we need these organic intellectuals to come into play, the organic educators to come into play and get inside these uh, different cultural institutions and transform them from within. Now, Lukács had a particular program also that bears on a lot of what we'll talk about later, which is that he realized that if you sexualize the children, you can really speed this whole process up to the next level. Sexualized children are actually destabilized from themselves. They don't they will turn on their family, they don't trust their religion, which holds them back from being their true selves. And so he realized that sexualizing the children is like the fast track to rebooting a generation. And of course, they're trying that again. Cultural Marxism didn't really go anywhere. By the 30s, before World War II, it wasn't really carrying a lot of currency anymore. It was too vague, it was too abstract. The conscientization process wasn't well enough defined by Lukács. Antonio Gramsci went to prison and disappeared. The fascists put him in prison. His writings, the reason uh, Joseph Buttigieg was able to translate the prison notebooks is because he wrote them in prison because they were smuggled out to Moscow on his death. Uh, otherwise, they would have been destroyed had they been discovered and maybe we would have been spared a lot of trouble. Critical Marxism grew out of that milieu and they said basically cultural Marxism doesn't go far enough. Cultural Marxism criticizes the cultural institutions, it criticizes the culture uh, reproducing itself, but it doesn't understand that it's actually the very terms upon which society is defined that are the problem. We have to go a different level. Max Horkheimer, in devising the critical theory in 1937, said that he devised the critical theory, he said this later about devising it in 1937, he said that he devised the critical theory on the understanding that it's the very terms of the existing society that prevent you from thinking of a different society, of a better society. He said that, the, that Marx was wrong. The, capitalism doesn't immiserate the worker. It actually makes the worker content. The, then the worker doesn't want to be a revolutionary. But you can't even define a better, because of this whole milieu of, of, of circumstances, you can't even tell the worker about a better world. And in fact, you can't even define a better world on the terms of the existing society because the problem of reproduction. So this is where they realize the problem of reproduction is key. They develop a tool called critical theory to challenge the existing order, the, the, the problem, the, the society that's reproducing itself. And they enter into a mode of pure, as Herbert Marcuse described it some decades later, negative thinking. As Max Horkheimer said, we can't describe the ideal world or the good society from the terms of the existing society, but we can criticize those aspects of this society that we don't like. You can relentlessly, or as Marx had it, ruthlessly criticize everything about the existing society that you don't like. So they went after the culture industry. They went after pop culture in, particularly, in particular because they believed it sells hegemony. It sells contentedness. It sells stability. The worker can go work, can go make just enough money because we passed antitrust laws, we have social safety nets, we've got mixed economies now, we have the post-World War II boom comes in eventually by the 40s, early 50s. People can go work their work-a-day job, come home, buy their Corvette, wash it on Saturdays, and they're happy. They got movies to go to. They can hang out with their friends. They got soda pops and stuff. Why upset the apple cart? They can't even see that there's an ideal world because they've been made conservative and comfortable and stable. And so what critical theory or evolves into is an absolute war on stability. And this is 1960. This is the 1960s. This is a war on stability. And in 1968 and 9, it kind of hits its pinnacle and it fizzles out. It burns out because it doesn't work. 
But the point is that the critical Marxists realize that it's the very terms of society that create the problem of reproduction, and so it's the very terms of society that have to be ruthlessly criticized at every turn. And that's all critical theory does, is criticize the very terms of the existing society. Now, this is the milieu in which critical pedagogy arises. The theory of education takes up where critical theory hit a wall. Critical theory, so you still had to pay attention to material reality, that was a thing. Critical theory had not seized education, and so it operated outside of the institutions, and critical pedagogy realized that we can directly, partly by reading Gramsci after he came out in 1970 or 71, uh, we can use education to overcome these problems because we can create a counter-hegemonic youth. We can raise a youth culture that wants to throw off the existing culture, a great refusal, as Herbert Marcuse called it. How do you do that? You steal education and you turn it into critical theory, political consciousness raising. How do you do that? You say all education is political. Ours is the good one. Yours is the chauvinist bad one. So the person who really made this happen is Henry Giroux, G-I-R-O-U-X. Henry Giroux, he was a big disciple of Friday. In fact, he was a critical educator, a kind of, uh, one of these you know, educators in the 70s who, in his high school, I think he was in Rhode Island, uh, Barrington, Rhode Island, or something like this, if I recall correctly. He's trying to get the kids in a circle and teach them that way instead of, you know, like you guys are classroom style in rows here. Um, he's trying to do all these innovative, break down the power dynamic in the classroom methods, and his principal is like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. And he hits the wall of despair. There's no way to do what I want to do. I know this is the way, kind of very enthusiastic vision. And in the late 1970s, 77 or so, somebody gives him a copy of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. In his desperation, he decides a week or two later to read it, reads it all night one night, stays up all night, catches re religious fervor, on fire, doesn't go to sleep for a couple days, shows up, yells at his principal, this is the way, this is the way, and not so much, but he becomes a devoted disciple of Freire and starts working it into his otherwise critical education theory that he's working on, that vein of Marxist critique. He, in fact, was very interested by this point already in the late 70s in Antonio Gramsci. He'd been reading a lot of Gramsci. He'd been reading the French postmodernists ahead of time, uh, earlier than a lot of other people were. He was a big student of Herbert Marcuse and Max Horkheimer and the critical theorists. Um, so what Henry Giroux did was he actually picked up Paulo Freire and combined him, as it's often written in stories about him or in, in biographies of him, with the Europeans, or the European theorists, who include the postmodernists and these German critical Marxists. And so critical pedagogy doesn't really emerge, it's kind of fomenting from the late 70s into the late 80s. And the way that it actually emerged, it turns out, is all falls on Henry Giroux. He's the father of critical pedagogy, not just in theory, but because of his relentless praxis. Henry Giroux is relatively famous in critical education circles because in the early 1980s, he went on the road and he got over 100 Marxists tenured as professors in colleges of education. So that when these books came out later in the 80s, they had a ready, willing audience who was going to write positive reviews of them, we're gonna get them accepted as curriculum in their departments, we we're gonna lobby for them. Some of these departments were already bending almost all the way there. Turns out he had a similar religious experience with Paulo Freire in the early 1980s when he came to Boston, when Freire was brought to Boston uh, and Giroux had just been denied tenure at Boston, uh, was it university or college, one or the other, you can look it up. He'd been just denied tenure, so he's obviously chafed a bit, and Paulo Freire comes, and they have this, like, there's this story he writes in his book on critical pedagogy at near the end where it's like, we drank wine all night and just complained about how everything works, and we bonded immediately over basically how terrible and oppressive the world is, and ever since then, he was basically Freire's huge evangelist. And what he did was he combined Freire and Gramsci, more or less, with the other critical education methods that he was already flirting with, this circular classroom, democratic classroom, overcome the power structure, you know, teach a little bit of stick it to the man, bring some left-wing politics into the classroom. Nobody quite knew what to do in the 70s to radicalize the youth, and they were experimenting with it. But what he did was he said, well, let's do this Freire stuff. And we'll talk all about Freire later, so we won't get too far into that right now. But let's do this Freire stuff but what's the role of the teacher? And he created this idea of a democratic classroom with a transformative intellectual in the form of the teacher. The teacher is gonna be a Gramscian transformative intellectual who guides the students into a process of conscientization consistent with all of Paulo Freire's work. 
How do you make the students politically conscious? We're going to use Freire's method, but we're going to organize the classroom according to a Gramscian model. And he cobbled these things together and defined that was the original definition of critical pedagogy, Henry Drew being its father. So the goal was to bring critical theory to bear on the analysis of society and on education itself at the same time. So it's to teach critical theory and to do critical theory to education to keep transforming education at the same time. Kind of the same thing I said before in microcosm. You have to change the system and change the people within the system simultaneously. And so he ushered in a huge shift out of the economic model of critique and into the cultural and social model of critique. He said in a book he wrote with uh, Stanley Aronowitz, another very famous critical pedagogue of the 70s. He wrote this book though in 1985. The book is called Education Under Siege. He wrote, a critical pedagogy then, this is where you can get a good definition of it, would focus on the study of curriculum not merely as a matter of self-cultivation or the mimicry of specific forms of language and knowledge. So you wouldn't want to learn to read like the people who are older than you. On the contrary, it would stress forms of learning and knowledge aimed at providing a critical understanding of how social reality works, Marxist conscientization. It would focus on certain dimensions of such a reality, uh, sorry, it would focus on how certain dimensions of such a reality are sustained. It would focus on the nature of its formative processes. It would also focus on how these aspects of it are, uh, that are related to the logic of domination can be changed. In other words, they're going to transform Mark, uh, education into a Marxist consciousness raising session. That's 1985 he's writing this along with another extraordinarily influential critical educator, Stanley, Stanley Aronowitz. And so it's this democratic classroom impulse where Paulo Freire, if you remember the quote from earlier, said everybody's going to, the, the, the radical educator is not afraid to engage in dialogue with his students. He's not afraid to engage in dialogue with anybody. He's going to talk to anybody. We're equals. Everybody's equals. The classroom's democratic. We're going to engage in dialogue constantly in class. It's not going to be a teaching process. It's going to be a dialogue between friends and equals. That's the model that he put out. And Giroux was like, yes, that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to use Friday's method to do it, and the educator is going to take on the role, no longer of teacher, but of facilitator into this process. Why? Because the terms of the existing society are corrupt, and you must be taught to see that. And the point of education is no longer to teach you to reproduce the form of society, but to see that the process of uh, the generating society itself, its formations, are intrinsically corrupt and have to be overthrown. This is the heart of critical pedagogy. It is that education should exist for the purpose of awakening people to the fact that the society reproduces itself unless it's Marxist, unless it's literally Marxist programming. I would say reprogramming, but you aren't reprogramming children, you're just programming them. The reason it got to that point, how did all the, the radicals end up going to the classroom instead of yuppiedom, I guess? or whatever, they all are yuppies, by the way. Uh, communism is not an ideology of the poor. It is an ideology of the rich and the guilty and the envious, depending on which one it happens to be. The moment of the, cr the crucial moment is, of course, those years around 1970 that we've already talked about, 1968 being key. That's when Pedagogy of the Oppressed was written first in Portuguese. It was published first in English. When I mean that, let me clarify. The first time it was published was in English not its first public, English publication as a translation. He wrote it in Portuguese. It was never published in Portuguese. It was published in English first in 1970, and then it was translated by a year or two later into most of the significant languages of the world, including Portuguese, kind of ironically, um, and republished there. But what we have is this pipeline that I was saying with the critical Marxists, Horkheimer, Herbert Marcuse, saying there is no way to do a positive vision of society Leading up to the riots of 1968, that burning out, nobody liking what's going on, and then you have this whole uh, utopian revival coming out of this depression when you read Herbert Marcuse and Paulo Freire saying, no, 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 there's another way. The way that Marcuse puts it is that if you rel rel relentlessly critique the existing society, then you can free the ideal society that's contained within it. Negative thinking necessarily becomes positive by relentlessly critiquing the problems of the existing society. And we can be utopian in believing that these possibilities of critiquing the existing society out of existence and the ideal society coming into pic the picture, that that's possible. And Paulo Freire said the same thing. And we can be hopeful about it. And Freire had read Marcuse. And he said, we can be hopeful about this. We can definitely be hopeful about this. Hope is contained in the idea that we can do this, that we can achieve this. And so there's this whole new movement happening there. 
And then Marcuse writes the crucial thing in 1972, counter-revolution and revolt. Turns out by 1972, he had to give it up. You're not going to get your 1968 revolution. You're not going to have a new society. You've got to give it up. So what are you going to do? He says you're going to go inside and you're going to become the thing. We're not going to be people who sit outside society and complain about it anymore. You're going to be go, go become computer programmers. Even in 72 he said that, computer programmers. You're going to go become educators. You're going to be professionals who bring with them their ideology. In other words, they adopted, and I quote from a 2016 paper uh, in this regard, they adopted a viral infection model for Marxism. Marxism would be carried from one institution to another like a virus by infecting students in, say, graduate school, sending them out into the professional world as people who bring the ideology in and start slowly transforming when they get the job. You're going to go undercover, you're going to do the thing, and we're going to march through the institutions, literally, is what he says in Counter-Revolution and Revolt. And so where did all the 60s radicals go? To the classroom. They realized that street activism wasn't going to work, and they all almost to a person, went into K through 12 activism, K through 12 research. All of them went into education, almost to a man, while Pete Buttigieg's dad is translating Gramsci into English. Um, so 1968, I said earlier, I kind of stumbled around, did it succeed, did it fail? Well, it failed superficially, but that's when the Cultural Revolution really started. I'll give you a point of comparison here uh, that ties into critical race theory, which obviously we're not talking about in this, uh, in primary, in this, this lecture series, but in China, in the 1920s and 30s, they unleashed a version of critical race theory in the Chinese context, and nobody knows this. There were same kinds of ideas, that the Han races got all this privilege, and that the, they set themselves up as good Han, and there's Han supremacy that's suppressing all the others. And the reason this was, was because in the 1920s, the Nationalist Party had power in China, and the CCP was competing with it, and on instructions from Moscow, uh, a young, exciting, um, guy with a big future in China by the name of Mao Zedong was instructed to infiltrate the Kuomintang and to start sowing discord within the Nationalist Party for communist ends. And what they did was they said, well, this idea that there's just one Chinese people, the Huarun, is actually Han supremacy. They're imposing Han identity onto all 56 races of Chinese. And they fomented racial discontent in the 1920s and into the 1930s that didn't bear fruit until the revolution in 1949. And it didn't come to full fruit until the Cultural Revolution in 1966. And so what we've seen now here is 40 or 50 years of them fomenting identity-based uh, discontent, discord in the United States, and then in 2020, George Floyd died and the Cultural Revolution started in earnest. It's exactly the same model. It is a tried and true model. Mao Zedong elaborated on it in the 60s, and we'll talk about in the Groomer School's lecture number three here. Um, and what you're going to find out is that, in fact, they are just reproducing the Maoist strategy uh, exactly. So this is a, this is a well-paved road. Critical pedagogy becomes a, the, a facilitator to it. How? Because you get the kids indoctrinated on this stuff so that the moment George Floyd dies, they're all in the street. They're all throwing bricks. They're the ones that are ready to go lay on the state house steps in Rhode Island at a moment's notice, even though they couldn't even read the story about what they're protesting about. Somebody had to tell them that it's about guns because guns has four letters and it's hard to read. There might be a little bit of hyperbole. <laughs> so what happened was radicals flooded education going into the 1970s, and we already heard from uh, Bowles and Gintis in 1976 in their book, um, but there were others. You know, schooling in capitalist America wasn't the only Marxist critique. We had another guy who was extraordinarily influential, his name's worth looking into, is Michael Apple. Not hard to remember in education, Michael Apple. He wrote a book in 79 called Ideolo uh, Ideology and Curriculum. And he was trying to explore how do schools reproduce society? And there's that idea of ideology. They teach ideology through curriculum and that reproduces society. Um, it's not just even the social relations that Bowles and Gintis were talking about in the school, although that's important. What there actually is, and this was a 1971 invention of Michael Apple that he repurposed in 79 for his book, so it has a longer history, is there's a hidden curriculum. Actually, he borrowed the idea from that fateful year, a theorist in 1968. It wasn't his own invention. There's a hidden curriculum. The schools don't just teach math and reading and social studies and science, maybe computers or whatever else. They teach people how to behave. They teach people what's appropriate and inappropriate. They teach all kinds of social 
functions, how to be a good citizen. They teach people that getting educated leads to a good job, and so that a good job is defined by what the, what the existing society thinks is a good job. They teach them to be little capitalists or little entrepreneurs or little workers. They teach them to participate in rather than to reject and challenge the existing society. So this hidden curriculum idea, which was first explored by Michael Apple in depth in 1971 in terms of science and social studies curriculum, becomes a backbone chapter in ideology and curriculum in 1979 in this book that he writes. And what he did in particular, I know I'm a little out of order here because I already talked about Gramsci and Giroux, is he's the one who really brought in a lot of Gramsci and got people like Henry Giroux and Stanley Aronowitz very excited about Gramsci. He realized through the 70s, after that translation, that Gramsci had the model that gets you into the educational sphere. That's the guy, the counter-hegemonic model. And so what we have to do is go into schools and we have to realize that schools are always producing some kind of ideology, except Marxism is the only non-ideology. So schooling has to somehow be reconfigured uh, at the level of curriculum in order to achieve that. So this book actually became the cornerstone book of curriculum studies in 1979, and it has been ever since. It's occasionally poo-pooed here and there now because of more better advancements in the theory, but largely curriculum studies is based on the thoughts of a Marxist in 1979. How did we get here? Conservatives just said, let's ignore education and let the left have it since 1968. That's how we got here. But this marks a key shift. If he's bringing in Gramsci, we're not doing Marxist critique anymore, we're doing neo-Marxist critique, cultural Marxist critique. And when we start bringing in Giroux on the back of this, it's even more neo-Marxist, cultural Marxist, and even postmodern critique. Postmodern Marxism is a better way to put that. And that's where we get Giroux's relevance really taking off. Ideology and curriculum is out there. There's a huge leftist push happening. And then something very important happened in 1980. Ronald Reagan was elected. And pardon my French, but the left collectively shit its pants. They thought everything's lost. Everything's over, it's all over, and so what did they do? They doubled and tripled down into the necessity of transforming education. And they even got Reagan's Department of Education, which was shiny and new at the time, and transformed it from within right under Ronald Reagan's nose. They collectively shit their pants that the neocons took over in 1980. So Giroux, really goes to work then. This is why he's running around getting 100 Marxists tenured in colleges of education. They have to do something and education is their way. They can do nothing about our generation or their own. We have to get the next generation. And how do you get it? Well, you get the kids if you get the teachers. So let's get the teachers. Where are the teachers? They're in teacher college. Let's get the teaching colleges. How do we do that? We get people tenured who are on our side. We start sending people in to be the thing that Marcuse had said eight or nine years earlier. He has this road to Damascus moment with Friday. He starts going crazy trying to get people who are going to be warm to Friday uh, and to critical pedagogy tenured all over the place. He starts dragging postmodernism out of feminist critique where nobody else in the world cared about it. Literally, nobody in the world, even the French philosophers, made fun of postmodernists or postmodernists. The German philosophers, the critical theorists, really hated the postmodernists. Even as they were starting to dip into kind of postmodern flavored analysis in the late 60s. They really didn't like each other. Only the feminists liked it because it allowed them to tear gender down better than any other thing in the whole world, which is their favorite thing and the only thing they ever want to do. You'll notice that they're upset now that tearing gender down turned into tearing sex down and the, so the dialectic progresses. And as Hegel said, history uses people or indoor movements and then discards them. Sorry, girls, it's over. You open Pandora's box and a dragon came out and the dragon has a penis and is wearing a dress. <laughs> If I was in Seinfeld, we'd say not that there's anything wrong with that. That's a postmodern show. So what happened though with these postmodernists that he brings in, Foucault and Derrida in particular, Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida, we're not going to do a long diversion into postmodernism, but what they actually did was they attacked in a Marxist way or through a critique the very idea of meaning making and the way that power works. They said that it's not so simple, even as what Gramsci was saying. I don't know that they were big scholars of Gramsci, but it's not so simple. It's definitely not just top down and it's not just institutions. Everybody's a participant in power. 
And so this idea of the democratic classroom that Giroux is screwing around with, and this idea of becoming the facilitating transformative intellectual that he's thinking of, this idea that we somehow have to change the society to a fundamental level to overcome the problem of reproduction is put kind of on, on like methamphetamine by the postmodern thoughts that he's reading. We have to transform the way that everybody interacts, the social relations themselves, actually do contour the entire society. And so we kind of come full circle into that and the, the, the educator under Giroux becomes a facilitator to transform society by transforming the role of education so that it completely uh, gets away from anything like the old reproductive model with the one exception that he kept the idea that you do need the educator as a facilitator that's central to Paula Freire. You do have to have the educator as a transformative intellectual in the Gramscian terms and the Post-structural is feminist, remember they're in the subtitle of the critical turn in education, that's what they criticized Giroux for. They went after him vigorously. They said, you're just basically setting yourself up like a king. You are reproducing the power relations. You're not producing a truly power-free classroom environment, which of course would just be chaos, um, that somehow magically breaks down gender roles as a first goal and then achieves better education apparently some, somehow secondly. Uh, but they criticized Giroux and actually pulled the idea even back further toward, um, out of his Gramscian ideas, deeper into the Ferrarian idea that all education should basically be like dialogue. So basically they're kind of accusing Giroux of being like the Marxist Socrates. And they're like, you don't get to set yourself up as the Marxist Socrates that's gonna lead people through things. No, 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 no. We're all equals here. We're just gonna use dialogue. We're just gonna talk it through. We're just gonna argue it through. Everybody's ideas are valid, but the more excluded an idea it is, the more valid it is. So let's prioritize the classroom according to standpoint theory. The standpoint of the oppressed matters. And that was a big Frarian idea. I shouldn't give you too much credit, though, or give them too much credit. They didn't like Paula Freire either. They liked him at first, and then they decided he was a man, and so that's also bad. Um, I mean, that's probably, they have a deeper critique than that, but let's not waste time pretending that what they actually said matters. He was a man. He set himself up as somehow really important. They probably actually saw that he was a guru. But what you have now in the critical pedagogy development with Henry Giroux is the incorporation of European theorists into Paulo Freire's much more Marxist theory that he had kind of devised on his own down there in Brazil. Um, Her Herbert Marcuse, Max Horkheimer, those critical theorists, Big influences on Henry Giroux, especially Marcuse. Antonio Gramsci, obviously huge influence on Henry Giroux. Those are Europeans, but also some of the postmodern thoughts. So postmodernism coming into education becomes absolutely crucial. What actually happens here is that critical pedagogy later by a guy we'll mention briefly before the end, uh, Joe Kincholo, actually has a name, uh, a very technical sounding name. The thing we call woke has a technical name. It is critical constructivist epistemology. And you can go look that up, and it has an entry on Wikipedia that you can read, and it's incredibly descriptive, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's the world we live in, okay. Critical constructivism is the hammering together of postmodern social constructivist ideas with the broader Marxist social constructivist ideas and the method of critical theory critique. It is where all of a sudden, the joke I was making about the feminists a moment ago, it is where you have to use somebody's um, standpoint in society to determine, their, their positional standpoint in society to determine whether or not they're valid. Everybody's equal except if you're more oppressed, you're more equal. That's what it boils down to. And so what we're going to do is criticize the entire society in a, in a uh, critical theory kind of way while jettisoning, jettisoning reality entirely and talking about it in terms of social constructivism. And so what you have happening in Giroux and his wake, starting with Giroux and developing forward, especially who codifies it in Joe Kincholo later, is the idea of moving into a critical constructivist model. Now this is interesting because I remember when we were writing Cynical Theories, Helen Pluckers and I, I know I saw a couple copies of it here today. Uh, I kept, one, you'll notice the chapters are like post-colonial theory, critical race theory, queer theory, feminism and uh, fat studies, disability studies, gender studies, et cetera. And there's no media studies, which is by the way really big, didn't have time or room to add that one, but there's no critical education theory in there, and there really needed to be. And uh, I remember reading some of these books and it was just a matter of we didn't have enough space. There's only so many pages, it turns out, they'll let you write and publish your book a lot of times. And I was remember reading some of Ferrari and Giroux, and I remember talking to Helen and saying, the incubator for all of this was critical pedagogy. 
Woke came out of critical pedagogy. Where did woke come from? The answer is the schools. Woke came from the schools. It's not these law professors. Critical race theories run in law that they always trot out to say it doesn't exist in schools. Irrelevant compared to its run in education. Its primary run was in education. All of these things fomented around how do you transform the children to think in terms of these cultural issues in a Marxist way. And so critical pedagogy becomes the absolute key to understanding where woke came from because they were devising what came to be called critical constructivist epistemology, a theory of knowing that's based in critical theory and social constructivism at the same time, even though they're somewhat oppositional. You might mix them with a dialectic if you were that kind of a person. Um, that goal of creating that way of knowing, and I say way of knowing intentionally, to, to import it into children is how woke came into being. That's all these other ideas, whether it's Marxist critique, whether it's post-structural feminism, whether it's post-modernism and post-structuralism directly, whether it's critical theory kind of more purely, all came to bear on educational theory, and that's the laboratory where, I mean, it's not in Wuhan, but something went wrong. <laughs> And Isaac Gottsman, like we said in the, the subtitle of his book, The Critical Turn in Education, lists three phases of this development, but there were four. There were not three. The first is the Marxist critique. That's your Bowles and Gintis. How do you overcome the problem of reproduction? It's all about reproducing for the political economy and the actual economy. That's what education's been set up to do. Um, he lists post-structural feminism, but actually before he gets post-structural feminism, there are three chapters on critical pedagogy. So critical pedagogy is actually the fourth dimension of the critical turn in education. So you have Marxist critique, the development of critical pedagogy, that's your Drew Freire pipeline into the nightmare schools that we have today. By the way, that's the line that won out. It gets infused with post-structural feminism because good Lord, don't ignore them or they'll ruin your life. Um, and then it added in critical theories of race. Now I do wanna pause for a minute to remark on the critical theories of race because circa 1995, that's when critical race theory got introduced full blast into education. By 2001, by the way, when um, critical race theory and introduction came out in its first volume, which is the volume I have, so it's not like I'm reading the third volume and hoping it's in the first, uh, they write that in the second paragraph of the book, as a matter of fact, that critical race theory started in the law, rapidly spread to other disciplines, most especially education. That's six years after 1995 when Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate wrote the paper toward a critical race theory of education, which was the seminal piece bringing it in. That's on the back of the 1994 book, Teaching to Transgress by the black feminist Bell Hooks, who was very influential on that kind of line of thought at the time. If you read that book, you can see just how kind of um, not pleasant and uh, almost sarcastic and passive aggressive, but also how deliberately activist in the same direction Bell Hooks was. But I wanna pause with Gloria Ladson Billings because she is also, she didn't just write this paper, she uh, the, toward a critical race theory of education, which by the way, I wrote this down, has over, or just short of, I'm sorry, 8,500 citations according to Google, Google Scholar right now. 8,500. Normally when I look up an academic paper and I'm saying, should, is this significant enough where I might talk about it on a podcast or something, if it clears three digits, I'm like, yeah, okay, big deal. Lots of academic papers don't get very many citations. 8,400 something. Very influential paper toward a critical race theory of education, but she wrote, Two other papers. She's not the, just the mother of critical race theory coming into education. She wrote two other papers. One is called, But That's Just Good Teaching, The Case for a Culturally Relevant Pedagogy, and Toward a Theory of Culturally Relevant Pedagogy. Both, all three of those papers in 1995. All three of them. So how did those do? But that's just good teaching. Just short of 6,000 citations toward a critical, or sorry, toward a theory of culturally relevant pedagogy, just short of 11,000 citations. These are monumentally influential papers. And what did she do? She imported Frarian critical pedagogy and put it in a racial box. She more or less says that's what she's doing. She literally just imported the Paulo Freire critical pedagogy model that had been being developed turned it into a Marxist theory of race instead of a Marxist theory of economics, 
and put it out there. She says that there are three goals to a culturally relevant pedagogy. The first of those, which she actually spends about one paragraph in these papers explaining what it looks like and what it means, is to ensure academic excellence. The second is to raise cultural competence. Cultural competence is this, it's a repackaging of what Paulo Freire called political literacy. Political literacy is the real goal of a critical education, to raise political literacy in place of actual literacy. Remember, 14% of the students in Providence could read, but they knew to go lay on the steps and pretend they died of a shooting that was in a different state entirely, so they could have a political agenda fulfilled for whatever teachers and politicians and whoever else put them up to it. And the third is explicitly, unambiguously, without apology, to raise a critical consciousness. That is, to conscientize into the Marxist view. In other words, culturally relevant pedagogy, and let this not get missed, steals education in order to turn it into political education. It is no longer about academic mastery, which gets lip service. It is now about raising cultural competence and a critical consciousness. It is to learn to read your political uh, environment in terms of culture, multicultural education, wh whatever buzzword, ethnic studies you want to throw on this. It is to learn to read your political environment instead of learning to read, and then to do so from a position of being critically conscious, or in other words, awakened to critical Marxist thought. It is a method of thought reform. So when they say, we don't have CRT in schools, we have the other CRT in schools. Like that fooled anybody. What they're actually saying is worse. It is actually worse. And those things go hand in hand because what you need to get is that education has been stolen. And we're going to talk about this later tonight after dinner. But the point is that what has happened with uh, Paulo Freire is he figured out a way to make it look like you're still doing real education while you're actually doing political education. It's to dress up the political literacy in the guise of a literacy lesson. That is the whole story. So what does it look like in your kid's school? We're not teaching CRT, we just make them read 11 books about slavery and then we have <laughs> uncomfortable conversations, courageous conversations, I'm sorry, about that for the rest of the day. The entire school day got hijacked talking about how it must have felt to be a slave and how terrible it was. And imagine what you, how terrible a person you would have to be to, help, to have held slaves, blah, 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 in the, uh, in, the, in the guise of having read a short story about Ruby Bridges or you know, somebody else, whatever else it happens to be. It is to introduce the concept in order to facilitate having to have now a big conversation about it. Why do they drag a drag queen into school? Because now you have to have conversations about why a man is dressed like a woman and acting like a clown because that's what a drag queen is, it's, it's a form of clown in which it is a man dressed as a highly sexualized woman who apparently not just wants to perform in, other, in front of other dissidents and for you know, gags and whatever in, in certain particular contexts, but they wants to be in front of children. Why? Because it's generative, because it makes them have the conversation, and then we have to have the conversation. Why is Disney showing so much sexualized content? Because they're going to go to school, and then they're going to have to talk about it. What is the justification for they have to cover pornography in high schools? Well, they're seeing it on the internet anyway, so we have to have the state step in and educate them about what they're already seeing. It's generative. And that's what they've done. They have a bunch of innocuous looking stuff that you know something feels wrong, and they've stolen education by turning the entire point of the classroom experience into having a dialogue about the thing. We'll talk about that more of the Marxification of education, but that's how your education has been stolen. That's why it's hard to fight. That's why when you show up to the school board, they're like, it's just, and they just say something. That's why they write an article about you saying you want to ban some book that's perfectly reasonable, when it's not perfectly reasonable, but it might be in and of itself but it's not in the broader context of all the other things that they're doing, and it's not in terms of what they're actually doing with it. So it's not the thing itself, but what they're doing with it that becomes the problem, and that makes it extremely hard to step in from an administrative point and say, stop doing that. It's just the teacher answering a question that came up in class after setting up the circumstances to make sure the question would come up in class. That is the theft of educational time. Every minute spent talking about your culturally relevant or culturally responsive or culturally sustaining nonsense is a minute you're not learning math. And that's what Gloria Ladson Billings in 1995 architected. And then over here in the great fine state of Virginia, and she is one of the lead authors on Ed Equity Virginia, which is one of the educational models that has been leading this state. 
She's not dead. She's still doing things. She's not like some character in the past. She's a character in the present who's still doing this stuff some almost 30 years later. And she has, between these three papers, let's see how fast I can add, over 25,000 citations from her three 1995 papers. So uh, culturally relevant teaching is just the importation under a different brand name of exactly the Marxification of education that we're going to talk about after dinner. So just to kind of touch on a couple of last couple point, uh, key points, like I said, this is where woke came from. Woke is the evolution of critical theories through critical pedagogy into the multicultural, cultural Marxist model that we're dealing with today, where cultures are identified with identity. Who you are defines your culture. If you're black, you have black culture, and there's a black community that you have to respond to. If you're white, you have white culture, and you're not aware of it. And it's part of white privilege to not know that there's white culture, even though every racially tinted comedian, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, or whatever, has made a joke about it since 1982. Every single one. But you still aren't aware of it, and that's your white privilege. If you are homosexual, you have a community. There's a gay community. We're being told on the news right now that it is homophobic to tell them to keep their pants on, even though we had to wear masks for months, years, because of the spread of a virus. You know how much thicker denim is than a cloth mask on your face? It's amazing, but it's homophobic to tell them that because it's part of their culture, apparently, to go to orgies, which, of course, is a homophobic slur. It is saying that gay men have low impulse control where it comes to sex. That's a homophobic slur. But they have a culture, and you can't challenge it. And that's who they know themselves to be. There's trans culture, there's gay culture, there's black culture, there's different Hispanic cultures, which has a degree of reality because they literally came from a dif different ethnic area. But you have to be defined in terms of that culture because the doctrine under these cultural Marxist ideas is materially and structurally determinant. The idea is that you know we are supposed to judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. But the new idea, the woke idea, is that's not possible because of structural determinism, the structure of racism, the structure of homophobia, the structure of transphobia, society itself is contoured in a socially constructing way through the inversion of praxis that we already mentioned from Karl Marx, so that you are made into who you are based on the conditions, the structural conditions around your identity. Systemic racism shapes who you are. White, black, Hispanic, Asian, doesn't matter. It shapes who you are. So the contents of your character are determined by the power dynamics related to the color of your skin that were erected allegedly by one racial group that wants to hold themselves up above all else. That's critical race theory in one nutshell. The contents of your character are determined by who you want to have sex with because there's a gay community and there's homophobia and this structural uh, heteronormativity has shaped the condition, whether straight or gay, in terms of who you actually are as a person how you understand the world, how you come in contact with the world, what the world means to you. We can't judge people by the content of their character. We can't judge people by the fruit of their merits because we can't ignore the fact that those things are themselves conditioned by structural and material determinism, which are two Marxist doctrines that are poisoning the well of how we understand ourselves in our society. That's why. That's what cultural relevance, cultural responsiveness, and cultural competence are teaching your children. That's what they've stolen education to teach your children, and that's where woke came from. And that brings us back to our friend Joe Kinchelo, who I said I would mention, uh, RIP, he has died. I don't know, I don't remember when, 2008 maybe, but that might be the date of his last book, but it's been about a decade thereabouts. Joe Kinchelo took up mostly in Canada but he developed the critical constructivist epistemology model. But what I really want to point out about him, because we're going to talk about Frede for a second, too, is he's, he connects another big link for you in what's happening in your educational world. And what Joe Kinchelow pushed is the decolonization of the curriculum project. He is the kind of architect of that. He is the architect of decolonizing the curriculum. Now, why are we decolonizing the curriculum? What in the world does that mean? Well, we have to go back to Paulo Freire. It turns out Paulo Freire was not a Marxist from the beginning. He had Marxist influence on him, but he wasn't a Marxist uh, 
until he got kicked out of Brazil in 1964 and went to Bolivia and got kicked out of Bolivia in 1964, like 20 days later, uh, and he fled to Chile and he took up with a bunch of Marxists and spent five years reading Marxist theory and was completely radicalized into Marxism. But he developed his educational model and deployed it in Brazil to great fanfare by the government at the time before he went and read Marxism for five years. He had Marxist influences, Dom Helder Camara, a priest in Recife, a communist bishop, he was called the Red Bishop, influenced him some. He was kind of brought up in that leftist, somewhat liberation theology, Catholicism, that influenced him some. He had certainly read some of it, but what he actually had read a lot of, first of all, his PhD thesis was in phenomenology, which is the broad uh, understanding, essentially, of, of the dialectic. So he's already kind of steeped in this line of thinking. And then secondly, um, and maybe more influentially, is that he was a post-colonialist. He had read Franz Fanon, who was deeply moved by Marxist ideas. He had read many of the other post-colonialists. He's in post-colonial Brazil. He's looking for a way for people to regain in Brazil their sense of person. And he had actually developed his education model as a decolonizing model of education. The idea of a generative theme that he developed, as we'll talk about later this evening, is in fact a method of bringing up the facts of the colonial context to get people to be radicalized about the fact that they've been colonized, to get the colonial adults that he's teaching to read, to read their political situation so they would, would reject it. So there's a straight line from Paulo Freire through his method of education through to Joe Kinchelow who codified it into the decolonize the curriculum movement. And the idea of decolonizing the curriculum is very simply this. It's to remove anything that promotes the existing culture, you've got to solve the problem of reproduction, and replace it with something that will spark a dialogue about a new culture. That's the point. And that's where it's very difficult, again, to see or to call out or to stop. And that's the hard part because it just looks like, well, we're just trying to introduce a book from a different kind of author. We're just bringing a drag queen in. What's the big deal? And it looks like education, sort of, not with the drag queen, but it looks like education. That's the hard part. So the decolonized curriculum is actually a curriculum that's not designed necessarily to radicalize on its own. It's not some radical Marxist book. It's meant to spark a conversation specifically about why don't we have more of this kind of book and why do we have so many of that kind of book? What's wrong with our culture? We have to tear down our culture. Alf Haben der Kultur is proceeding through education. That's the point of the decolonized the curriculum movement. The main story, which we'll turn to after dinner, is the story of Paulo Freire, the godfather, not the father of critical pedagogy. Freire was ignored primarily for the first 15 or so years after Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He did have a stint at Harvard. He did have a couple of papers in the Harvard Educational Review, and he was largely ignored. Um, pedagogy of the Oppressed was in English. A few people read it, not much. Giroux reads it in the 70s. It's not, in all these other books that I, I referenced, he's not mentioned. Freire is not even mentioned in the books in the 70s, not even talked about. Just wasn't really on the radar until his book, Politics of Education, came out in 1985, and then Giroux pushed it into like every college that he could get it to, every friendly hand he could get it to, got it massively positively reviewed in the Harvard Education Review, and blew him up in the American and North American markets. And that's the key of what he did, is he enabled the, fe the theft of education that we're talking about with a critical turn, and the way he enabled the theft of education is that he Marxified education. He didn't introduce Marxist, it wasn't about the curriculum, it's not even about the process. He introduced a Marxist form of education. The entire theory of education gets rewritten in terms of a Marxist theory. What it means to be educated changes. And so that Marxification of education, is what we're going to spend time after dinner talking about, transforms education into something completely different, and it enables the theft of education. Education becomes political education. Literacy becomes political literacy. Competency becomes cultural competence. Literacy becomes cultural competence. Being educated or being college and career ready, and you read, go read all your documents, go read what the state departments and national, federal department of education are saying. College and career readiness, college and career readiness, college and career readiness is in terms of your social and emotional learning uh, competencies put forth by the Castle organization, which is explicitly communist. The goal of the theft of education is to no longer teach academic mastery and instead use the opportunity of education to teach a political perspective. And in fact, the only legitimate political perspective in Marxism is Marxism because every other one 
just is ideology, just reproduces the existing system. And when you do that, you have stolen education. You keep its outward form, you change out what's inside. I tell people it's like if you went to the drag racing track, I used to know a guy that did this. He took a big Corvette engine out of a Corvette and he stuck it in a station wagon. And then he would go to the drag racing track with his station wagon, and everybody laughed and he'd rip them. And it's like, that's what's happened here, right? They built a, he called it a sleeper, right? And he had nitrous in it, the whole thing. He called it a sleeper and it could tear down the drag track so much faster than anybody expected. That's what they've done to education. Only it's a different kind of engine. They've taken the actual en engine of academic mastery out of education, kept the outside shape of the education department, the schools, the form, the function, and plugged in a new engine, which is Marxist thought reform. And the point of this theft is to escape the existing system, to beat the problem of reproduction, and to do it particularly from the bottom up and the inside out. You wanna change the culture inside out. You wanna change the social contract, so you need people to believe that the old social contract stinks and you need a new one. You wanna change the youth into a radicalized uh, cadre that will take action in the street when George Floyd dies or when Mao Zedong raises his fist. That's what you're looking for, it's the exact same process. So what we take away today then is that your kid's education has been stolen from them. I want you to think of it that way. It has been stolen from them. This is a crime. Millions and millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer money have gone into education and that millions and millions and millions of dollars has been redirected from you the taxpayer into something you would never support if you knew what it was, if you knew that it was happening. It has been stolen from you. I think that you are owed it back. As a matter of fact, that's a very radical thing to say. It is an incredible crime. The name of this crime, the name of the theft of education is written down, it is clear, it is obvious, it is easy, it is critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy represents the theft of education and it follows from this unfolding critical turn in education where Marxist critique tried to attack education. It has nothing to do with old John Dewey and all of this. He's got relevance and that's another conversation. It's that the critical turn in education attacked the problem of reproduction that Dewey couldn't solve, that the other Marxists throughout the 20th century couldn't solve, the critical theorists ran into a wall with, the critical theorists in education, especially using Paula Freire's method, by Marxifying education itself, were able to get around the problem of reproduction, first using Marxist critique to set the stage, saying it has something to do with how the school operates, the hidden curriculum in the school, that's the primary curriculum. Notice now that the math, the reading, et cetera, is secondary and the political education is primary, where it used to be math, reading, et cetera, are primary, and they said, well, there's political education too, therefore we have to flip the script. Total Marxist inversion, that's what they've done. And what we're here to do is learn to recognize this. This was kind of a history lesson, this wasn't a practical lesson. We're here to learn to recognize this so that we can learn to fight it. If you can't see what they're doing, if you can't see the magic trick, you can't fight it. Then we can learn to correct it, then we can demand accountability. Maybe we get restitution if we push hard enough. I doubt it, but from whom? I don't know. I do know big leftist foundations that have dumped oceans of money into this that could be sued. You're not probably gonna get it from the government, but you could probably get a lot of, uh, they'd say, what, there's no blood in the stone or something? There's probably a lot in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Just suggesting that there's a lot there. They've deliberately, that organization in particular, among others, is deliberately dumped oceans of money into remaking education in exactly this direction. When I say we need to learn to recognize it though, that is actually the key thing. Um, this is, a, in a sense, you know, it's like a magic trick. There's sleight of hand, there's sleight of mind as well. What they've done is kind of both of them. If you encounter a magician, they wave around in their hands some cards and then the card changes and you're like, how did that happen? Oh my gosh, and when you see the trick, you're like, oh. So what they've done is they've made education look like it's still education, but it's not education, it's political literacy. And when you see the trick, you're like, oh. But if you don't see the trick, you show up at a school board meeting and you start yelling and they're like, you're a crazy person, go away. <laughs> but when you see the trick, you write an affidavit for a lawsuit that explains the trick and then the judge will be able to see the trick and we'll be able to see that it does in fact violate the law. And if we get where we really wanna go, that it violates the establishment clause and we get rid of this problem Big league, as somebody might say. So thanks, let's have dinner, and we'll talk more later.